And good morning. If I can get you to have your seats, we're going to get started. We're ready to start the service. You can. We had. Yeah, let me get my bulletin out here. A lot of stuff given to me at the last minute. I'll try to make heads up. All right, it's good to have you. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad to have you. We hope you feel right at home. And if you don't mind, there is a little tear out in your bulletin. So fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by, please, for if you want to have a record of your visit. And we're glad to have you this morning on this beautiful sunshine day that God has allowed us to have. We had 46 present in Sunday school with an offering of $2,121.22 to come through Sunday school. Praise God for that. If you're not coming to Sunday school, let me invite you to come to Sunday school. You're missing a blessing. We have some great teachers. I'm going to preach this every week. Come be part of Sunday school. You're missing a blessing. So if you can, get up that little bit earlier and come on and be part of Sunday school. Also, don't forget this afternoon at 345, leaving at 4, but you need to be here at 345, the youth, the winter youth rally. Matt and the youth are going to, uh, Matt, let me see. Yeah, thank you, First Baptist Newbern, for the winter youth rally. So youth, come on, be part of that this afternoon. All right, so y'all bear with me. I got a lot of cards, and they were just handed to me, some of them. But I'm going to start reading them right here. All right. It says, Blessed are the givers. Dear Brother Charles and church family, thank you so much for your prayers, love, and support during the passing of our dad, L.D. Kennedy. We appreciate you hosting dad's visitation and funeral service at Macedonia. The meal provided in the fellowship hall after the service was such a blessing to our family and gave us a chance to visit with family and friends. I know firsthand all the work and dedication it takes to feed so many people because I volunteer in our church's bereavement co committee. What a wonderful way to minister and serve as the, as the hands and feet of Jesus. Thanks to providing a lovely chiffalier plant during Dad's service. Dad and Mom loved all the people of Macedonia of church. Your love and support with visits, calls, and cards over the years has been so appreciated. Thanks again, Brother Charles, for praying with our family and for hosting Dad's service. We are grateful he's with Jesus, whom he so faithfully served for many years. In close, it, well, I'm not going to read that. All right, got another one here. And these are all from the Kennedy family, so y'all just bear with me just for another minute. It says, thank you. Macedonia, thank you all so much for honoring Dad. Your service and hospitality are greatly appreciated. L.D. Kennedy's family, God loves you all, all of us too. I got one more. Now, with that being said, they enclose some pictures of this one. Make sure on your way out, uh, ushers, put these on the back, some pictures of Brother Kennedy of many, many years ago. This one is uh, Brother L.D. baptizing at the Henning Farm Pool, which is right down the road here. Uh, I can't read exactly what it says, but... And this one is, brother, this is the old church here. This is Macedonia Church near Ripley, my second pastorate. Brother Kennedy's family sent all these pictures. And here's the other and another picture of the church. It says, Macedonia Church at Edith. And it says, thanks to all the Macedonian members for remembering my father. Enclosed are some pictures for the church archives. Thanks <clears throat> to the ladies who had the meal. Love to everyone. That was from Mark Kennedy. So we're going to put these in the back. Don't take them, so we're going to put them in the archives of our pictures, but what a great blessing. And we do remember Brother Kennedy's family. Remember, uh, he was such a, a great person, great man of God. So please remember him in your prayers. Also, I have one uh, more announcement here. April the 22nd and 23rd is the men's golf getaway. I'm going to call it that, right, the men's golf outing. It will be at Pickwick Landing. And this will be an overnight stay, men, if you choose to come overnight. Now, you don't have to, but this is an overnight stay. The cost is $130.50, and that includes one round of golf. And the money will do by, is due by March the 15th, which is only about three weeks away. So we'll be having that in the bulletin next week. Just remember that, men, if you plan on going, get signed up. We'll put a sign-up sheet in the back also. Um, we look forward to having a great time. That was a good time there before. All right, let me continue on. Don't forget this afternoon after church service tonight, the cantata is on. There will be practice, so if you want to practice for the cantata, come be part of it. We need some help, I promise you. So we are having practice tonight after service, so remember that. Another announcement is uh, last night's uh, Valentine's banquet was a great success. I'm going to say thank you all who helped by cooking, serving, preparing meals and plates. 
whatever you did, we thank you so much. There was over $1,000 raised from that, and I think that rounds, deserves a round of applause. Now, there were some costs. There were some costs, but overall, it was a great, great, uh, 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 I'll give you that in a minute, turnout, and we appreciate you coming and supporting the youth. All right. Let's see. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, are there any other announcements? It is good to have you this morning. Can I have the usher? Oh, Brother Terry? Thursday night Bible study with Dr. David Jeremiah. Here at 6 o'clock, correct? Here at 6 o'clock. You still have time to get in on that if you'd like to? Yes, ma'am, Miss Carol? Y'all yes. all heard that, right? Yes. A sleeping mat work day Tuesday at... 10 o'clock? Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So if you haven't ever helped with that, you can help by bringing bags. We still need lots of plastic bags still, right? They, these ladies make some of the most awesome sleeping mats you've ever seen. Maybe we'll get one up here. I think there's some downstairs. Maybe I'll bring one up next time before y'all have that. But it's pretty cool what they do. What a blessing. Uh, make sleeping mats for the homeless, and they're awesome. So uh, we've given a, they made, we're not giving, they made a lot. So I'm not sure how many they made, but I know that they're continuing so please, if you can help, come be part of that. You can cut strips up, all right? <laughs> you can put some mats together with them. So remember that. That is Tuesday at 10 a.m. Any other announcements? If not, can I have the ushers, please? There you go. Miss Carol Farm has one. Look at that. Now, these are made out of plastic bags, y'all. Now, ask Miss Betty and Miss Mary and Miss Carol. It takes a lot of work. Those are plastic bags. <laughs> Those. <laughs> and I'm not sure who. And I know I'm leaving some ladies out, y'all. Please forgive me, but what a great blessing. Those are awesome, though. So that's their, that is what they're doing, and it is an awesome ministry. So thank you for that, ladies. Roger, can you pray, please? children.
For the children that are 12 years old and under, y'all can come up. I have a bulletin to share with you, and we're going to talk for just a few minutes. And I always need your help. So if you're a visitor and you're 12 years old and under, you're just going to stay up here for a few minutes. Miss Kelly Ann and Mr. Patrick look like they have children's church for three, four, five, and six year olds. So they'll have a big time studying about God there. So it's good to see everybody. Is that better, Mom? How are y'all doing? Y'all good? Aren't these mats really neat? That is too cool, isn't it? I always thought that was awesome. Somebody left a crock pot up here, but no food. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> so y'all are doing good this morning. Very good. All right. So who are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Jesus this morning for sure. Have y'all ever heard that song that God is so good? Have y'all heard that song before? Have y'all heard it? Do you know it? So the little, yeah, the tea time says she knows it. Some of y'all know it. Can you help lead that? <laughs> y'all know the one, God is so good. God is so good. Okay, y'all start. One, two, three. So Jesus talks about that in the Bible, how we should treat others. So one of the verses that I know that y'all have heard before would be, and let me make sure I say it correctly, listen and see if you recognize this. It says, as you would that men should do to you, you should also do to them likewise. Now a lot of times we hear that as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What does that mean? We know God is good to us. What do you think the goodness is that he wants us to do for others? Who has that one? So if I think about and if you think about how you want others to treat you, do you want others to treat us with kindness or meanness? Okay, when I think about how I want others to treat, do I want others to treat me with love or with hate? in a way where they stare or they hold things from me, we won't share it. So when we think about that, do unto others as we have, as if we would want them to do for us and do for ourselves, how do we treat ourselves? We're kind to ourselves, aren't we? So we should show that same kindness. Now here's the thing. This in our little uh, bulletin today, it says Jesus talks about loving our enemies. Sometimes our enemies, they may not care. responsibility because God is so good to us and he gives us that goodness in our hearts that we can share that goodness with others around us. So even though we may have people who are not so kind to us sometimes, it's a big deal for us to still show them kindness because God has shown us his kindness and his goodness. So the, go with y'all in these verses. We're going to read them all. There's quite a bit of verses there. But I circled like some key words that I wanted to share with y'all. So going into how we should treat others, it says, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you. Man, that's a big deal. Our grown-up grandkids. Still be good to those who may not be good to us. Bless them that curse you. Ooh, can you imagine that? To pray for somebody even who may have just told us a thing or two about ourselves. <laughs> Go ahead and pray for them. Because they need God just like we do. Okay? And it goes on down to say, give to every man that asks us. So many people that we come in contact with, if they need something, share it. Give. Okay? Going on down, it says, love them. Be good to them. Bend to them. Let them know how little something is. How do we show them? Love your enemies. Be kind. Be merciful. 
person and take that and it can be taken away. Judge not and forgive not. So they shouldn't be saying that out loud, but they're expressing that a judge not. But they in, in some ways they forgive the people that they do the harm to while they're doing it. And this is the one, and I thought I saw this in the Bible, and it's in Joel, but it says, I know that is a place of place on Joel. So it says, Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Okay, what happens if I shake myself and run over? It's going to blow. Do you not? Does Lily say that in here? Well, I'm really not going to talk about you. <laughs> but when you say something, are you are you glad? The dancing thing. <laughs> yes, you're glad. <laughs> so when you think about, I want this to be the picture in your mind. This is kind of the picture in my mind when I think of God's blessings that are shaken together and running over. Y'all told me if I pop this open and I release everything that's in it, then it's not going to pop everywhere. God's blessings, I like that. He wants us to show those blessings through to others where we can give love to people that's running over because that's the kind of blessing from love that he gives to us. So God's blessings are always spewing down on us, and sometimes we don't notice it. So when we read these verses, think about how that's shaken. It's shaken. So God's shaken, and he's going to give us all the blessings for doing the things that he asks us to do. And it's not only going to bless us, but it's going to bless others that we're around too. He puts you in special places for special reasons. You're with the people you're with because God put you there. So he wants you to be able to make a difference in their lives too. And you know what I know already? I know each one of you well enough that you're already making differences in people's lives for God that you may not even realize. But you know what? It's okay if we don't realize it because God knows it. And they know it. Their lives are changing with the people around them. So thank y'all for doing what you do to show God's love that we don't get to show. So thank y'all for your help. You going to remember that? How God's blessings are just so abundant. There's so many. And they just need to be out. <laughs> All right. I need some help with the prayer. Just so we know we have our prayer time. I know I usually have volunteers on this anyway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. And let's see. I'm going to call in one person to say a prayer for us. What about Mr. Patrick? I know he's going to be teaching the kiddos. So pray for them. Thank you. of the Lord this morning. I've got to bring a backup for my iPad because one of my kids thought it'd be funny to unplug my iPad and plug those up <laughs> last night. That's how it happens. So we're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Are we ready to worship this morning? Yeah. I want to I wanna do two little, two little insults in here. I, uh, from, from the youth counselor and myself, I want to thank everybody for supporting the youth. We were, we were blessed, and it was
was hectic at some times, but we made it through. And then also, youth. Any youth out there that can hear my voice, you're more than welcome to come tonight. We're leaving here at we're leaving here at four o'clock to head to the Newburn. I about said Dallas. We'll be at First Baptist Newburn. We're gonna have games, minute to win it games, um, and you can win prizes at these minute to win it games. You can win gold, silver, or bronze trophies. Um, they're also doing food. We'll, uh, I think it's tacos. Uh, we're gonna worship with a, a, a local band that comes out of Mount Vernon called Two Worship. It is the uh, young adult worship band they have that they put together for the young adults and they also brother mark is going to bring the message that this evening so all the youth you're more than welcome to come we're going to leave here at four o'clock so please be up here at 3 45 so we get on the bus and head out we do not want to be late and miss time for for worshiping games so let us stand and in your hymn books or on the screen on the, in your hymn books turn to page 550 Footsteps of Jesus. your hymn books we're about to be in uh hymn 476 in the garden but i love that we started off with that song because that second part of that song in that third verse it says that we uh that we are following the footsteps of jesus and when he got in, in the book of mark when we said that when he uh he was resurrected and he uh showed back up to his disciples he he had one job for his disciples to do he had a to-do list for them, and that number one to-do list was to go and share. And that's the number one to-do list that God has for the church, is to go. Well, not to be sleepwalking Christians, as I told the youth this morning. Well, to be actively going, actively seeking after the lost. And that was Jesus' heart, and that's the heart he left for his disciples, and that's the heart he leaves for us. To seek after the lost. 
you have your hymn books on the 476, they're going to sing In the Garden. of the message this morning, turn to your hymn books of page 413. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh. 
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we turn our eyes upon you. Lord, in the darkness that's going around in the world today, you are the light. Lord, we have the light inside of us. Lord, let us put at the top of our to-do list to share that light with others. Lord, that we are a church that is known for sharing the gospel. Lord, that we're not sleepwalking anymore. That we'll get, we get off the sidelines and we go. Lord, put us in the game. Lord, put us in the game to where you can put people in front of us that we will eagerly go and share the gospel. Lord, right now I pray for Brother Charles as he comes forward. Lord, you hide him behind the cross. Lord, that we see you and we hear you. Lord, that when we see you and we hear you, Lord, that we also take action and we do what you tell us to do. Whether it's come to the altars to pray, whether it's to, to give our life to you, Lord, we us to come up here and pray that, Lord, we haven't felt you in a long time. Lord, we come back and get that relationship right with you. Lord, let your spirit move freely among this place. Lord, that you just keep Satan so far away from this building, Lord, the distractions. Lord, just, just any problems going on, Lord. Lord, you lift them, we lift them to you. Lord, so you can take care of them, and we can listen and follow your ways. In your name, amen. Amen. If you would take your Bible this morning and open up to the book of 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy, we begin a new series on Sunday morning and Sunday night. We'll be going through the pastoral epistles and looking at the blueprint of the church on Sunday mornings, and we're going to be dealing with the Acts of the Apostles on Sunday night and dealing with lessons from a first century church. And so I want to encourage you to be here for both of those. When we come to our text before us, we need to understand Paul or Paul is, is writing to young Timothy in First and Second Timothy, dealing with the blueprint of the church. Young Timothy is a timid minister. He's a minister with experience. He had been in Macedonia. He had ministered in Ephesus. He had ministered in Corinth. He had ministered in several places. And we know this through the book of Acts if you went back and studied it. In fact, Paul and Silas brought Timothy on in their second missionary journey. And he sent Timothy to these different areas. And the first time he sent him to Ephesus as his minister and as his servant, as a, as a mouthpiece for him, because Paul could not go there and had to go to Macedonia. And so we look at these different things, and what we come from this text is there are times when we need instruction from the Word and encouragement from the Spirit. Amen? We, we at all at times need to be reminded what God wants from us, His children. Let us be reminded of our place before the Lord and in service to the Lord. And let us be reminded of what God expects from all of us. As we come to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, really what we see is the sole purpose of the church and also the emphasis of Paul's letter to Timothy. And if you're there this morning, say amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father in Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which ministers questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now to the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and God, we seek you this morning. We seek your truth. We pray, God, you speak today, speak to us and through us. 
God, remind us what it's about. It's about encouragement. It's about salvation. It's about love. It's about standing firm for the truth, Father God. God, help us be the church you want us to be. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Paul begins and he gives the idea, he's talking about himself to young Timothy, but he's also speaking to young Timothy at the same time. When I look at verse 1, I, I, think, of the, I think of the point of remember who you are. Remember who you are. If you claim to be a child of God this morning, if you claim to be a Christian, and you truly are a Christian, then you are not who you were before you accepted Christ. Amen? You're not on that same purpose and that same mission. As Paul wrote to other, other churches, he, he said, be different. He said, stop sowing to the flesh and sow to the Spirit. And we find in verse 1 that Paul identifies himself an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul, as he writes to young Timothy, reminds Timothy of not only Paul's authority, but also Timothy's authority. And in essence, our authority. It's an authority that was sent, for that, 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 that authority that all sent of God have. It's an authority based on the power of God in his word. So I would remind us as believers this morning that the, we need to be reminded of the believer's position. Of the believer's position. Paul addressed Timothy by first stating his position with the Lord. He stated Paul, an apostle, meaning that he was called out. It was Apostle means to be called out. It means to be sent of God. He was stating that he was a commissioned delegate or ambassador for Christ. He, come with, he came on commission. He was ordered, commanded. His commission was not just from anyone, though. He was a delegate and an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And therein lies where his authority and power came from. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand we may not be apostles. Uh, the, the whole qualification for an apostle was to have a face-to-face -face view with Jesus Christ. To have that experience with Christ. But the reality of it is we are all sent on a mission, amen? That we are all to be sanctified, which is to be set apart. We've all been called to go. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, does he not say, go, amen? Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, you are an we are ambassadors to the world for Christ. That we are all ambassadors, and so our position in Christ is to go and tell and minister to others. Amen? It, it's, it's not to sit in warm pews. It, it's, not to, it's not to be sitting in cozy and air-conditioned rooms and, and heated rooms, but it is to be faithful. It is to be servants of God in going and telling others and ministering on, get this, on Christ's behalf. So your position is you're an ambassador to the world for Christ. You are sent out. You are commissioned a delegate of Christ. But not only do you have to understand the believer's position this morning, as I said, therein lies his authority and power and where it came from because we have to identify and be reminded of the believer's power today. The believer's power. Paul addressed Timothy by stating his position with the Lord. He stated, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Or it goes on and said, the delegate or ambassador, let me correct myself, the delegate or ambassador does not go or represent on their own authority or power. Do we get that this morning? When we go and tell others about Christ, we're not telling our story, we're telling Christ's story. Even if we share our testimony, we're still sharing the faithfulness and the work and the change that Jesus Christ has brought through us. Amen? That we're going with His story, His message, His word. They go on the power and authority of the one that was sent them. Paul states of Jesus Christ in the end, by the commandment of God, our Savior, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That Greek word for authority within the New Test gives the meaning of decree or authoritativeness. In other words, when we go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, we're doing it by the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen? Is that not what Jesus told his disciples? He said, all authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and earth, in the Great Commission, 
And he says, and then, I am low, I am always with you to the end of the age. In other words, the same authority that I have, if I'm with you, you're acting and serving in that same authority that I have. The disciples and the apostles weren't going under their breath, their energy, or anything else. They were going under the commandment, the commission, and direction of God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to briefly touch this as we get into our text tonight. I'll, I'll go more detail tonight. But remember what Jesus told his disciples in Acts chapter 1. We find that Jesus told his disciples at the end of the gospel, reminded in Acts chapter 1, he says, go and wait in Jerusalem until I give you the promise of the Father. Well, what was the promise of the Father? Amen, the Holy Spirit. Somebody got it. When we act, we serve, we minister, it is by the same Holy Spirit and the same authority that God gave Paul and Paul was, it was, more, it was exercising and letting young Timothy know he had. And so as Christians, we need to remember the believer's position. We need to remember the believer's power. And we know that the apostolic stage has come, but the qualifier of an apostle, as I said, was that face-to-face -face encounter. But every born-again believer has a place in the family of God, i.e. the church, and we were able to exercise gifts that the Holy Spirit has empowered us. In fact, Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13 says this, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for perfecting the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ, till we all come in unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and unto a perfect man, unto measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not every one of us has the same call. Not every one of us has the same gifting. Not every one of us has the same position. In fact, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he says, is everybody this? Is everybody that? But each and every one of us have giftings. Each and one of us have talents and gifts that the Holy Spirit of God has empowered us to carry forth the gospel. Amen? That each one of us have giftings and talents that God has empowered us to use. The list that before us in Ephesians is not an exhaustive list of gifts and positions within the body. But it is a fair reminder of the different positions and gifting that God has empowered each of us to follow and do. And along with these gifting that God gives us and the empowerment to fulfill those services and be the ambassador he has called us to be, our Lord Jesus Christ provides us encouragement to remain faithful and steadfast. Faithful and steadfast. Which brings us to our third sum point of the believer's promise. We need to re remember the believer's position. We need to remember the believer's power, but we also need to be reminded of the believer's promise. Paul understood where his strength, purpose, and hope came from. And so do we. He reveals this by declaring the Lord Jesus, which is our hope. In other words, our hope is not based in you and I. Amen? Our hope is based in Christ and Christ alone. His promise, his assurance. As written in the Holman New Testament commentary on the pastoral epistles, it says, as we believe in the Son and rest in his finished work of paying for our sins on the cross, he takes away our fears of punishment, he removes our guilt, he assures us of heaven, in short, he is our hope. There is none without him. What hope do we have outside of Christ? What strength do we have outside of Christ? What power do we have outside of Christ? We need to realize that our position, our power, and our promise all come through the person, Jesus Christ. We can't do it without the church. Amen? And so Paul reminds young Timothy of this. And then not only does he remind him of who, who he is, but he also reminds him of God's great love for him in verse 2. God's great love for him in verse 2. He says unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Je or, and Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Paul is greeting to young Timothy not only brought about a greeting, but also a prayer of intercession. I remember one time, Brother Bob Hall, y'all know as my mentor, wrote me a letter one time, and I'm just going to give you an idea of it. I'm not supposed to ever talk about this. I really don't care, though. I went on, I went on a, a walk to Emmaus years ago. Uh, I did an Emmaus walk. Loved it. Loved it. Toward the end of that, this special something, and I, I won't get into all the great details of it, but it involved a letter to me. And I remember sitting in my bunk, reading the letter. God just speaking to me in person. And I got to Brother Bob's letter. And the very first line of it, Paul wrote to his friend, he wrote to his other pastor, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And then he went on. What y'all don't know about Brother Bob is there's not a day that goes by that I do not get a text from Brother Bob saying, I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for Mary. And I'm praying for the sister Nancy. Four o'clock in the morning, I get a text. Ding! I already know who it is. He's encouraging me in prayer. He's greeting me and then interceding for me. Amen? And that's what Paul is doing here for young Timothy. He's greeting him, but he's also interceding for him. He prays for God's great love to shower down upon Timothy. And may we have that same prayer for ourselves and those that believe with us. May we remember that God's great love for us and his children. Paul reminds Timothy in his prayer for him of God's great love. He reveals his love to the saints in three very specific areas that were brought to light within our text. God reveals his love for his children through his show of unmerited favor. Paul says, may God's grace be with you. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize that show of unmerited favor. In other words, we did nothing to earn our salvation. We did nothing to earn God's love. It is unmerited, and we did nothing to deserve it, and God just gave it to us. Even when we were yet enemies with Christ, God demonstrated his own love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God showed his love for Timothy and Paul and us through his grace. He shows his love of compassion. In other words, may God's mercy be with you, Timothy. May that passion, that compassion that God has for his children be upon you. And young Timothy, may you find quietness for your soul, peace. Brothers and sisters, we live in a very restless and peaceless society, do we not? I mean, it's pretty crazy that I, and and I'm not making light of this, so please don't take it light. But I don't watch much TV. I I don't watch a whole lot of news. But you know when I find out what's going on with Russia and Ukraine? is about midnight when I finally crawl in bed. Between 10 and midnight, I crawl in bed, I look at my phone, and I say, I wonder if we're at war yet. Because I don't watch TV a whole lot of times. And we live in a day and age where you can't turn the TV on without getting anxious. You can't read a paper without getting anxious. You can't do a Google search without getting anxious. Brothers and sisters, there's only one way to find hope and peace in this world, and that's quietness for the soul, and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so Paul intercedes on young Timothy's behalf, and he says, I want you to know and I pray for God's grace to fall on you, his mercy to fall on you, and your, his peace to fall on you. And while the world is searching for these three things, favor, compassion, and quietness, God is already showing them and, ex, and, ex, and giving them to us in and through his children. Do we not? So we've got to remember who we are. We've got to remember God's great love. And in all this, we still got to remember to stand for the truth. You got to remember to stand for the truth in verses 3 and 4. You have to remember, Timothy, despite his experience, despite his missionary journeys, despite the fact 
because his grandmother and mother were Christians. And his great-grandmother and blessed him, and, and we'll find out later on, that taught him. And despite that he's been with Paul, who wrote 17 books, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he is still timid. And so he needs encouragement to stand firm on the truth. I, I see many Christians who, while they are bold in their faith, are also timid in their faith. Because they know the truth, and they speak the truth, but when that pressure hits them, they step back. They never deny the truth. Don't get me wrong. They're just not willing to push the truth. And brothers and sisters, what we need to, in this society, in this day and age, is to learn to push the truth of the Word of God. Amen? Stop being timid. Stop feeling threatened and just stand on the Word of God. And so Paul brings us to young Timothy. He says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus in verse 3 when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest change some that they teach no other doctrine or charge some that they teach no other doctrine and neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the faith so do. Paul told young Timothy to stay at Ephesus to fight against false doctrine. This is actually addressed in the book of Acts and Paul states as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. In other words, it wasn't everybody in the church that was causing mischief. It was just some. But some is all they need sometimes. May we understand that when God is moving, Satan will attack. And while, he, and while, attacks, uh, while attacks come against the church universal and the church local come from the outside, more often than not, it's not from the outside, it's from within. Amen? And this is why Paul pled with tears to the Ephesian leaders to be on guard. In Acts 20 and verses 28 through 31, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember by that the space of three years I have ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He says with tears I've warned you. Paul has sent young Timothy to Ephesus to stand on guard. Because what he had warned them about for three years had come to pass. Had come to pass. It is with this heart that Paul tells Timothy to stand on guard and teach, rebuke, and reproof. He says, stand for the truth. He says, I don't care if you're timid or not. I know you're young, but your power and authority come from Jesus Christ from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from anybody. It comes from Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Stand for the truth. Brothers and sisters, we've got to learn to stand for the truth of the Word of God. Amen? We've got to learn to stand firm regardless of the call. Regardless of what attacks may come, we stand for the truth. And we need to realize that Satan will bring a lie. Paul tells young Timothy, go against those and teach them that there is no other doctrine. And why? Because evidently another doctrine had come into play. It wasn't the pure doctrine of the word of God. It wasn't the pure doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul warns Timothy that there are those who are breeding lies that are not in an area where they may be, that, that are in areas where they may be disputed. But these things were in central core teaching of the word of God. Neither give heed to fables. That word fables was actually a direct comment talking about false doctrine. Old prophecies. Other prophecies that were not biblical and were not accurate. They thought maybe they had a different word that came from somebody else other than God. That God could speak through somebody else other than Paul and Timothy and Silas and those he had chosen. Uh, uh, when somebody comes to me and they say, well, I got a word for God. 
I sit there and look at him, and I have a whole lot of questions about him. Because the Bible has told me that all prophecy is from God. From in the beginning to amen is all we got, brothers and sisters. Amen? When I see religious leaders step up and say, I'm a prophet of Jesus. I believe we got to be a prophet. I believe it's all right here. See, I, I believe in a, a, a limited revela- or a limited revelation, not that, in, in, but also a full revelation at the same time. And you say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, we, we got all that we need to know right here in the Word of God. We got the full counsel of the Word of God right here. That's the full revelation. But we also have a limited revelation in the fact that we don't know it all because God hasn't told us at all. Amen? He gave us what we need. Brothers and sisters, if somebody comes and says, well, I got a new gospel for you, you need to look at them and say there is but one gospel, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is but one truth, and it's the word of God. All man's lies are in the way. There are those who stated the prophets and Channels of, channeled God's word outside of what was spoken in the Old Testament, the teaching of Jesus and the writings and teachings of the apostles. All this did was breed confusion. Let us be reminded of who the author of confusion is. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, Paul writes, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. If God's not the author of confusion, that only really leaves only one other option. And guess what? That's the devil. Amen? As El Diablo. He's the author of confusion, not God. Why do you think we have the confusion that we have in the church today? Why do we think we have confusion over undeniable truths and doctrines? Why do you think we have confusions about the word of God? Why do you think we have confusion among our children and the people of this world? It's all Satan and it's all driven by the enemy. The truth is so obviously before us. As we teach the truth by declaring the word of God, many find themselves at odds with others in authority, others in academia, at odds with our family. Our children are as confused as anything. The word of God says this, but our society and our flesh tells us this. And may we understand that Satan is the father of lies and confusion. It is God who shines light into the darkness and brings clarity of mind and heart. It is not society. It's the word of God. Paul tells Timothy, as I tell you today, stand for the truth. Teach that no other doctrine will be taught other than that which is of the scripture, that which is of the Lord. And as we fight the enemy and the confusion that he breeds, let us remember that while we stand, let us remember the purpose of it all. Because our purpose is not to hate. Our purpose is not to degrade. Our purpose is not even to fight. The purpose of it all is found in verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity and out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. The purpose of it all is love. Amen? That we hold the greatest love letter ever written. God's love letter. Brothers and sisters, there's going to be a tremendous sacrifice when Christ returns and he gathers his saints. Brothers and sisters, may we realize that the purpose of it is love. Now, the end of the commandment is love, period. But we also have to realize the purpose doesn't matter without the proper motive. If you tell somebody you love them just to get something out of it, out of whatever the motive's off amen if we're going to love we need to do it with a proper motive Paul gives Timothy a reminder why we serve why we minister the purpose is love but he also reminds Timothy that the motive behind the service is just as important as the purpose itself Paul gives three characteristics of a proper motive to the purpose of love True love 
come from a sacrificial and cleansed heart, free of selfishness. When I serve in faith, when I preach the word of God, when I minister to others, I'm calling them to live for me and to love me. Would you never be out? Anything that we do should not be to get a pat on the back, but to grow our ears and to love our neighbor. Amen? The second thing is true love comes from a standard and practice of life that adheres to the standard of God's word, not society. This has a good context. We miss something in the 22nd century when we're not. When we look at a good conscience, we look at it as, it doesn't bother me. Well, as long as I don't feel guilt about this, it should be okay. But for the first century believer, that was not a definition of conscience. A good conscience defied that those who I was part of, those that I belonged to, the group that I was within, nothing of my action... Nothing that I said or did would cause them harm or embarrass them or problems within that group. And so, brothers and sisters, when we take the real meaning of good conscience, because it can't mean any more than it meant then now, okay, brothers and sisters, because the message doesn't change. We have this idea, well, it means something different to me today. No, it doesn't mean anything more today than it meant then. The same meaning, the same truth to them is the same meaning and truth today. So when Paul says that you need to have love from a standard in practice that adheres to the stand of a good conscience, it means that it adheres to the standard of the word of God and it would not bring embarrassment or shame to the household of faith. We need to get away from I feel this away or I feel that away. Or my feelings got hurt. Or I don't like this, or I don't like that. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how we feel or what we like or don't like. What matters is what the Word of God says. It's not about individualism. It's about community and faith and love and standing by the standards of the Word of God, not society. It's about the truth of the word of God because there is an absolute truth and it's called, Thus saith the Lord. Finally, true love comes from a strict conviction found in the word of God. Faith unfeigned. Faith unfeigned. I close with this. We're called to remember who we are commissioned by and by whom authority we present the truth. And upon that truth, the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're to stand and guard it without, con without conviction, no, I mean, with conviction knowing the enemy will do his best to birth confusion within society and especially within the church. And as we stand for the truth, guard the truth, and declare the truth, let us remember the purpose of it all, love. We are to love as Christ loved and still loves. We are to be light in a dark world. We are to be a reflection of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And let us remember that the purpose of this book is the purpose of standing for, guarding, and revealing the love of Christ revealed through salvation and hope that only comes through Jesus Christ. So one last witness before our prayer. Will you join me? Thank you. Everybody stand, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father God, we come before you this morning. God, we seek you this morning. We seek your truth. We pray that if there's anyone here this morning, Father, that doesn't know your son Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they'll walk this aisle and say, I need to know him. God, may you be honored during this time of invitation. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.